I mean, you've been there, right? Where you're just not in the right frame of mind to play. You, you don't know how to get your emotions handled. And you just get steamrolled. And not even by your opponent. It's, it's you doing it to yourself. I'm running away from this pain. I'm trying to find a new way. Yes. What's going on guys? It's Coach Steven with 15 points of tennis and it's a gloomy day today. Of course, it doesn't matter that much because likely you're watching it at home. You're not here out here on the court, more than likely. But I'm doing this topic on a, on a gloomy day for a reason, all right? At clinic, we send the kids to play sets, to play matches, and we monitor those, monitor those matches as coaches. All right, so put out two kids who are very similar in skill level to play a set. And... I come back literally seven, eight minutes later, and this one girl, she's down 4-0. And you should think, oh my God, okay. Now, she goes up to the line, serves, and, and, and you know, loses the point very quickly, and then she grabs the ball super quick, and she's up to, back up to the line. She serves again, she misses a forehand. Oh, now she's sulking around. You know, clearly she's not having a good day, right? You can see where this is going. And again, she gets the ball, she goes up to the line, and it's just, repeat, repeat, and you can see this downward spiral of a player. And what do you know, three minutes after that, 6-0, she gets bageled. And as coaches, we're always trying to figure out what happened. We're always trying to create the awareness for the student what happened as well. Because the student, a lot of times, doesn't know why it is the way it is. One of the other coaches was telling this one girl, look, you know, tactically, you got to be more creative in your offense. You got to open up the court before you attack. You got to find different angles. And you know what? I think that coach was spot on correct. But my assessment was very different. All right. The way I saw this situation, what was really hurting her, because if you look at tactically, if you look at technically, she could hit the ball well. She wasn't doing the wrong things by by any means, okay? I mean, sure, there are always little things to pick at, but she wasn't doing anything majorly wrong. Now, it's not what this girl, and this happens to all of us guys, so pay attention real closely here. It's not what this girl was doing during the points that was hurting her. It's what she wasn't doing in between the points that was hurting her. So get that, all right? Not when the ball was in play, but when the ball wasn't in play. And a lot of you guys think that you're only playing tennis, that tennis only occurs when the ball is literally going back and forth over the net. That is not true. So as coaches, you know, a lot of times we're looking at more than just what goes on during the point, the ball going back and forth across the net. We're looking at how the player carries himself, their body language, their demeanor, their, their energy level, okay? how they carry themselves, again, from point to point, how they build from point to point, how they make adjustments from point to point. All these things matter. And what's really funny is when you look at a player's behavior when they're not playing the point, you, it's almost in a scary way reflects their level when they are playing the point. So if you look at recreationally competitive players, all right, they kind of act in a certain way. When you look at college players, okay, they're, they're better. When you look at pro players, there's a big difference between how they carry themselves. And let me tell you, this isn't just some facade or the demeanor that they put up or their game face. It's not just some facade they're putting up. This really matters to get results, to, to create your best tennis when you're, when you're out there and the ball's actually dur and it's during the point, okay? This really matters in terms of winning and getting a result beyond just looking pretty. That's what we're gonna dive in today. So, like as usual, Thank you so much for supporting the channel. That subscribe button, sometimes you subscribe to the channel and a lot of times, like YouTube these days, you don't really get notifications. Um, the new form of subscribing is if you can hit that bell and that way, again, you actually get the content in front of you because that's not always the case and that I know for sure, okay? Because I subscribe to a lot of things 
I, I don't really get notified when they put out new stuff. All right, so again, appreciate it so much. We're gonna rock into this video now. For starters, if you just want the quick version, and I know a lot of people don't love the more mental type of videos, they just want the more technique videos, which is okay. If you want the quick rundown, I'm gonna give it to you right now, all right? But if you want the full impact of this lesson, you're gonna actually sit through and see how this all wraps together. Because I'm gonna wrap it together to give you the full impact. All right, but let's start with this, all right? And here's a quick version. You have 30 seconds allotted in between points. 30 seconds, all right? From when the point ends to when you need to get to the line and serve or, or, and or receive, but play at the server's pace. What should you do? What should be done in between these 30 seconds? Okay, what are these 30 seconds used for? First of all, if you've, number one, if you played a physically very exhausting point, right, and your body is depleted of oxygen, you're, you're tired, if you, if you played a tough point and you're breathing hard and heavy, you go up to the line, look, that's, and, and you're serving again, that's the most like, likely chance you're gonna double fault again. You're gonna make some silly error off the return and not be ready and shank the return. It doesn't make sense to go up to the line. Look, go back to the back fence, take deep, calm, centering breaths, lower your heart rate, get that under control, okay? Before you go back up, right, to, to the point, because you're not gonna be, again, physically prepared. If your legs are aching, just give your body some time to recover. Now, it seems simple, players don't do this, all right? It, it, now, for me personally, when it, it comes to dealing with tolerance to pain, what I like to do is, especially if I played the first brutal point of the match, look, when you play the first brutal point of the match, your body is gonna be kind of in shock because a lot of times you'll have nerves and anxiety or different feelings in your body. You won't be used to that or you, might, you won't warm up with that same intensity. Your body will feel that shock of, right, of, of stress, of, of strain on your body, on your system. I like to go to the back fence and just really just, just internalize that feeling and try to normalize it and set that expectation for myself that this is what's gonna occur throughout the rest of the match. And that way, when that feeling comes up again, I can, I can grind it out. Instead of, if you try to ignore that feeling and tell yourself that it, it's a negative feeling, right, and not accept that feeling, well, you're probably gonna go back into the next point to try to avoid that feeling and get impatient. All right, so really internalize it, tell you, and, and just embrace that feeling, because when you normalize it, it won't feel as bad the next point and the next point and the next point. All right, so that's the first thing, and that's the least important reason. All right, the next thing you should focus on, the second thing, when you're taking those 30 seconds in between points, is to prepare yourself emotionally. So tennis is, as we all know, a very emotional sport, ups and downs. There's times you're so frustrated, you just want to pull your hair out, and I get it. And so if I want, if, if I play, a, if I'm frustrated for whatever reason, the win, the, you know, the, the opponent cheated me, whatever, I'm playing bad, and I walk up to that line, and my, and, and my focus is scattered, I'm thinking about the last point, I'm thinking about, I'm getting mad, down and mad at myself, and my focus is scattered, and my energy is scattered, there's no way I can put all that focus and energy on the present moment, that next point. And that next point is the only thing that really matters, because one, it's the only thing you can control, and it's the only thing that's gonna affect the outcome of the match. Nothing you did in the past is gonna affect the outcome of the match, obviously, right? So to go back, whether it's self-talk, and now that can be, look, something like self-talk and developing your own process to deal with yourself emotionally and understand your emotions, whole, whole separate video, all right? But that's one of the other things, so that, that self-talk, okay? Or at least letting the, if, if your emotions are boiling, letting it settle a little, simmer a little bit, simmer down a little bit before running up to the line and self-destructing. And a lot of players self-destruct, yes, all right? Very common. The last piece of the puzzle, okay, and then we're gonna go into some deeper stuff after, is, and the third thing is, these points happen so fast, one after another after another. If you're playing these points so super fast, 
I mean, look, we all know that tennis is an impromptu sport. You're just, there's so much stimulus that happens during the point, you're just reacting, reacting, reacting for the most part. But whether it's that 30 seconds, or whether it's that 90 seconds on a changeover, you can have some proactive thoughts instead of just purely reactive thoughts. And thinking about, okay, you know, what combos is my opponent running using on me that's effective? How can I attack my opponent's weakness better? Where am I getting hurt? Am I getting pushed around? Do I need to change my court position? Have they adapted to my combos and I need to switch things up and add more variety? So, again, not to overthink those issues, but to put a little distance between you and the match, take a breather, have a moment of awareness. And again, awareness meaning awareness of your own body and how you're playing and awareness of how your opponent's playing. See, some players play so fast, they blink like three times and the set's over. Just like that girl I talked about, okay? It's over. So, so look, those are the three things that you need to focus on in those 30 seconds. And not all of them. Sometimes, some days, one thing more and sometimes the other. Sometimes none. It really depends. Now, on the premise of everything depends. And in tennis, the answer is almost always it depends. Because you have 30 seconds, but you see Roger go up to the line, bang, ace. 10 seconds later, bang, service winner. 10 seconds later, bang, slice out wide, forehand up the line, winner. And then the game's over in literally 60 seconds. Whereas Nadal, you see him kind of trot around, you know, bounce around like this, right? Go through his, his long routine, take the full 30 seconds. Very, very different. So there, there's something called, obviously, there's personal player preference. But what's even more important that I want to describe here is it really depends, and, and there are general rules to how long you should be taking. Now, get this, right? If you're getting blown off the court, if you're getting smacked down, so what things would occur for that to happen? If your opponent is on fire, if your opponent, if every ball they touch, every, every ball they hit on their strings is just like clean, they're in rhythm, they're just crushing winners on you, and, and or you're not feeling good, you're playing bad, you're playing down, you're just not seeing the ball well, right? So if your opponent is playing up, you're playing down, what you want to do in that case is stretch out the points Put as much time between each point as possible, the full amount of time if you can, and stretch out as many points over as long duration as possible. And why is that? Tennis, just like anything else, whatever goes up must come to, normally comes down. If you're playing bad, well, you'll probably start to play better, right? Because there are a lot of factors. You know, one being, let's say, your adrenaline level. Sometimes you might catch a second win later in a match, or you might come out a little sleepy, or you might, you or your opponent might lose a little focus for a bit, or just, or, or again, just have a hit of adrenaline and, and be really sharp for a few moments, all right? But if your opponent is blowing you off the court, okay, instead of just going up to the line and letting them blow you off the court again and again and again, and the match should be over in 15 minutes, take a little bit of time, okay? Maybe their adrenaline might come down, but think about this, right? If I fed you a ball and fed you a ball and fed you a ball and fed you a ball again and again and again repeatedly, and you were, and you were just in, in the zone, in a great groove, and you hit winner after winner after winner after winner, okay, that's one thing. But another thing is if I fed you a ball, and let's say, bang, you hit a winner off that ball, and then I said, okay, 30 seconds, wait, let's wait. That was like five seconds, okay? But 30 seconds is a long time. I made you wait 30 seconds. Okay, maybe now you're not quite as pumped up. You're not quite as energetic, etc. Then I fed you another ball. Okay, boom, maybe you hit another winner. Okay. I said, let's wait 30, another 30 seconds. And I waited and waited and waited. That changes the dynamic of the match in a big, big, big way. Okay? Now look, <laughs> you know, on the flip side, if you're destroying your opponent, and your opponent's just in a bad frame of mind, they're coming up to the line, they're in a bad mood, right? And sure, you know, win 15 out of 20 points. 
go, go on a run, steamroll them, right? You want to get to the line as quickly as possible if they don't have that awareness to slow down. And it's almost like taking a timeout in basketball or a timeout in football. You know, as a coach, when you see your team discombobulated, you might say, hey, let's, let's call timeout, guys. Let's talk this over. Just even take a breather physically or, and or mentally. Same thing in tennis. And you, in tennis, you're out there coaching yourself. If you're watching yourself out there a little discombobulated and or things not going well or someone else getting in the hot hand, for instance, you might, it might be a great idea to take, put a little bit more time between points or et cetera, okay? Now, don't be unethical with this because Again, if the skill gap is so big, it won't matter, right? Because tennis, is, there's so many elements to tennis. This is just one of them. And this is a great element. No, it's not underhanded. It's called this, you're playing within the rules and you're having a massive amount of awareness between what's going on with you and your opponent and the, and, and, and the awareness of time, okay? So it's great awareness training, all right? So it's not unethical, but don't abuse it. So quick story, my buddy and I were playing a, a tournament in Sacramento this is a junior tournament many years ago, and I know he had squeaked out the first set like 7-6, and he had lost the second, he got, he got smashed the second set like 6-1, so they split sets, and he tried to ice his opponent down. He went, normally you tell the line judge, and you give that, there's a 10 minute break between the second and third set, and then you set the timer, right? So he didn't tell the line judge, he just went to the locker room. He came back 25 minutes later until the line judge realized like what's going on here, why aren't these guys playing? But anyways, he went to the locker room, just sat there. The match didn't start till 25 minutes later. And he kind of got what he deserved. So he still got, he still got beat in that set. Um, and that, he ended up losing. But, you know, <laughs> use it within reason, okay? Within reason. What a difference a year can make. Oh, that's a tank. He's kind of imploding. Early in the second set, the 20-year-old appeared to give up completely, and the crowd was disgusted. 40 love. Now, that girl, remember, that I, I mentioned at the beginning of the video, who had lost at that set 6-0? Look, she looked so beaten down. I told her to come over because, you know, I want to talk to the, the student a little, just for a few moments after, after the set to do just a, even a quick breakdown, right? And, oh my God, she looked like she's having the worst day of her life. Her body language, her shoulders were slumped, she was moping around. And I'm like, okay, look, what happened out there? Like, I'm, because clearly that wasn't her. I'd seen her half an hour prior in the drill session. She didn't look like that. How in the world could someone look like that? You, like, you couldn't say anything, you couldn't do anything for someone to look like that. But here's what she was doing. And then this is what I told her, this is what you're doing. That 30 seconds we talked about, so she had played the point. Okay, maybe she'd miss in the net, whatever. She'd miss the wide. She would come back to the fence. And instead of the things I was talking about, for 30 seconds, she would punish herself and punish herself and punish herself and punish herself and beat herself up mentally for all the bad things she was doing. And then she like, basically, she, it looked like someone had like literally beaten her at the tennis racket, but she did that to herself. Okay, she would do that to herself. Go back up, up to the line. She'd be in this terrible mental state. Now, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen when you serve that next ball? It's going to be a disaster. You're, you're not in the... And what do you think she looked like at the end of the match? Okay, and, and this is, here in and of itself, this is the question. Now, on one end of the spectrum, look, look guys, I totally get it. All right, I'm not the type of coach who is you know, all about being soft on the players and saying, oh, you know, if you don't feel good today, you can't play. No, I, I totally agree. And I can, you know, at some point I'll make a video on, look, you got to find a way to win. You're, we're not robots. We're not going to feel good every day. Our emotions are changing. Like emotions are just passing moments in our lives. We should be able to separate our emotions, okay, from the things we need to execute on, set our emotions aside. It's just distractions. Right? Because if you want to get real results, you have to wake up every day and, and plow through. Look, I get that. I get that, I get that, I get that. All right? I'm not a proponent against that. So that's on one end of the spectrum. So I'm pushing hard on that end of the spectrum. But I also understand the other side of the spectrum. Okay? And I think you'd have to be an idiot to disregard the fact 
that your emotions also do matter, okay? And unlike that girl who's emotionally depleted, like your emotions absolutely matter, and, and here's why. I'll give you two reasons. So A, the first reason, is how you feel and your emotions, that is your experience of tennis. All right, that is, is tennis to you. So like if you're out on the court and you feel anxiety, misery, agony, okay, emotional pain, negativity, look, and I get it, like, you know, you see Novak Djokovic explode and Federer get upset. Every, we all have our spurts, but if that's your reality every single day, that's what tennis is going to be for you. It's going to be a negative experience. So, like, let's say you're pushing through. Look, you can, you can do well for a short period of time. Stay motivated. Three months, six months, nine months. But try to, try to be in that state and have that relationship with, te- with, the, with tennis and be able to push through three years, five years. How, what, how will that be in terms of longevity? All right, I think it's pretty self-evident. Now, the second reason is more practical. Maybe something you care about a little bit more right here and now. The second reason your emotions matter is think of like the, the best day that, that you've ever had playing tennis. And if you haven't had that day, I, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, you're going to have to play. You haven't, maybe you haven't experienced that yet. But for a lot of us, if you think of your, your absolute best, even if it wasn't your best day playing tennis, and I'm talking about maybe sets or moments you've had on the tennis court, right? It, tennis didn't feel like this drag, like you're experiencing all this self-resistance, fighting with yourself and, right, this agony and, no, no, no. It, when you were in the zone, everything was just flowing. Everything was just natural and easy and carefree and you were playing from a place of, of inspiration, okay? Not from a place of desperation. You were letting it happen. It's kind of bad. I bet you, when you were playing your best, it came from a very healthy emotional state. Whereas liberating, it wasn't draining your emotions, right? It wasn't, you you wouldn't have to feel something from within yourself. Again, it was liberating and energizing when you played and you wanted to play, all right? And that's the difference. And what I told that girl in that match is while you come to the back fence and for 30 seconds you punish yourself and beat yourself up and you're beating your emotions so they're going in a downward spiral you feel worse and worse and worse about yourself as I play as I go through a match and in my process as I go from point to point to point to point my emotions go up and up and up and up I'm feeling better as the match goes on because I'm raising my emotions. I'm self-generating my emotions. Again, I'm, and we're talking about in another video, self-generating emotions versus your emotions being dependent and reactive on, the, on what's happening in reality. But in, in terms of self-generating emotions, look, I'm, I'm probably just as bad as anyone out there in terms of feeling nervous and having anxiety before a match and not feeling really good in my own body. But as the match goes on, Look, I'm feeling, I'm feeling the flow even more and more and more. And look, I have terrible days too, don't get me wrong. But for the most part, my mental process is I'm coming in here and reinforcing the right things. I'm building myself up emotionally. And that's the difference between a downward spiral versus someone who's, who's driving their emotions up and up and up and up. Okay? And you can see that in a player. You can just look into their eyes and see are they beaten down or are they empowered? Reminds a little bit of center court in Wimbledon. Unbelievable point. <laughs> Unbelievable point. Five all. All right. Here's where here's where we kind of bring it home, right? I know if you stuck with the video this long, I really appreciate it. <laughs> all right, but here's why to me this this really truly matters, even even beyond that, even beyond what we just discussed. When we talk about emotions, emotions are the most chemically addictive substances in our body. And you, more addictive than the worst of worst drugs you can, you can think of in terms of addiction level, right? And, and, here, and here's what I mean. 
think about the most negative person you've ever, someone who kind of bitches, complains, and whines about everything. Just someone super negative, right? And like I said, we're all addicted, addicted to our, our emotional state. Take that negative person, put them in externally the best environment. Send, them, send that negative person to a tropical paradise, let's say Hawaii, and give them the best accompaniments and, and, and everything is perfect. Now, now, you might put them there and for half an hour, an hour, 45 minutes, they might be in a good mood, they might be happy and everything is going great, but they're gonna find, that negative person is going to find a way because their body is addicted. Their body craves that, that, that emotion, that negative emotion to run on. That person is going to find something. That person is going to say, oh, that Uber driver pissed me off. That, you know, oh, the waiter who was, took so long to bring our food and didn't attend to us first. And that person is going to find a way. You put them in the best external environment, that person is going to find a way to drag themselves back down to a negative emotional state because they're addicted to that emotion. And on the flip side, you, as you probably guessed, I'll, the, you can put a positive person in a bad situation. Hey, they lost you. They got lost somewhere, right? And, they, and look, we're all human. We all have the right to be upset for a little bit. Uh, okay, maybe you might mope around for half an hour, but like a, a positive person will always try to find the good, the challenge. Oh, it's a learning experience. Look, it's challenging. It's interesting. Instead of even in a very negative situation, right? They won't let that affect them. They're going to find a way to be positive again. Now, how does this relate to tennis? A lot of players you. I know you know a player. I know you know a player who can only play well and raise their level if they get mad and upset at themselves. And that's what they think. They think they can get, they have to play that way. But now in another video we'll talk about, you know, negative versus positive. Okay, usually a lot of those negative emotions are very emotionally draining. Okay, you feel drained after instead of, of energized. Okay, but, okay, that's for another video. But there's some people, again, who... who who, who crave, who need, who can't break that cycle, all right? And trust me, for players who we, we practice positivity with players, to break that cycle is hard. And actually to break that cycle, it takes a lot of mental energy. Like if I get, if I take someone who's used to being negative or habituated to being negative and I make them be positive for 15 minutes, they're going to actually feel tired after. And here's why. It takes a lot of energy, okay, to override your biological mind because Biologically, we are programmed to be negative. So, think like many thousands of years ago. Let's say you're in the you know plains of Africa, right? Where we, we humans live differently back then, right? If biologically, let's say something good happened. Let's say you found a pot of honey. Wonderful, right? Okay, that can only help you so much. Something positive can only help you so much. But something negative, for instance, like being chased by a lion, that can be life-threatening. So something negative can be life-threatening, while something positive can only help you so much. So what does that mean? Biologically, we're much more keen to focus on the negative. All right, we're, we, we're so fine-tuned and dialed in to the negative things that occur. So to be positive goes against our biology, right? I mean, to be, in theory, to be hard working when you're talking about tennis and running down balls, like biologically, our body, we want to be lazy because our body wants to conserve energy, right? So we have to go against our biology if we want to be, have work ethic. We have to go against our biology. Like I said, if we want to be positive, all these things go against our natural human biology. Now, look, you know, it's, it's not easy. We all struggle with it. We all have days. But when you habituate yourself to being more positive on a day-to-day -day basis, and look, you know, it gets, when you habituate yourself, it gets easier and easier. And when you start building momentum to, to be positive, it, it, it takes less and less energy to keep going, right? Like feeding a fire that keeps going, okay? So I want to wrap the video on that note, all right? And not only can changing your emotional mental state, taking that 30 seconds, the practical things, but what impacts me is I see a lot of very talented players. Talented players never reach their potential, just like that girl who could have been even with that other player instead of losing the set 
I mean, you've been there, right? Where you're just not in the right frame of mind to play. You, you don't know how to get your emotions handled, and you just get steamrolled. And not even by your opponent. It's, it's you doing it to yourself for the most part. All right? We all self-sabotage. Okay? We all self-destruct. But to create a little space and awareness, and you can't ever prevent it entirely, okay, I want to make you aware of it in this video. Okay? So that's the first part. The second thing is, it just pains me because like tennis, it's a joy to play. I love, I appreciate the game. I feel like we're all out here to truly enjoy and appreciate playing this game. To see someone so beaten down after they've played and, and to know that the game is making their life worse instead of better, that really hurts my soul. Okay? All right, so thank you so much for getting to the end of this video. I hope it's, if it's not something that can change your game tomorrow over the long term and show you that everything you do on the tennis court matters, not just hitting the ball, but how you think, how you prep for each point, so you're playing every point to your optimal. All right? Thank you so much, and we'll see you. Hopefully when it's a little bit drier, we'll see you on the next episode.